morning everyone <clears throat> hopefully you can hear my croaky voice um, if you can hear me can you just type into the chat box that you can so that i can make sure that's working before we get started welcome to the webinar lovely to see lots of familiar names in that list some of you from a long way away Good morning. Great. Abby, you're back. Two mornings in a row. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Isabel. I hope you're safe over in New Zealand. Well, I know you're safe over in New Zealand because you guys have managed this extraordinarily, but I think you finally got outside in the last week. So I hope that's been enjoyable. And I can see another good friend of mine from the other side of the world, um, Jennifer Reynolds. So I hope you're safe over in Canada. I'm just going to wait a few minutes for people to join and then I'm going to take you through, I guess, five top tips on uh, making the shift to fixed price value price billing in a law firm, something I've done over the last few years. And some of you have heard me tell these stories before. It hasn't been easy. Um, so the goal for me with these sorts of webinars is to try and give you, I guess, a head start so you don't make the same mistakes that I made. Um, as we're just waiting for a few more people, if you have any burning questions around this, um, please feel free to toss them into the chat box now and I'll do my best to answer them as we go. If you um, haven't participated in a webinar with me before, please know that I do love people to try and communicate with me as we go. Um, so use the chat box ask questions, I, I'm always happy to try and troubleshoot things as we move along. So yeah, any questions you have, any like, golly gosh, why am I doing this? Um, throw them in the box and I'll try and manage them as we go. Just gonna get my slides up. Hopefully I don't lose the chat box, which is often what happens to me. I move one thing and then, yep, there it goes. <laughs> Everything disappears all at the same time, always the way. <laughs> Okay, I've got it back. We're all good. All right. Fixed and value pricing. Um, welcome. So I, um, the last few months, particularly since all of the changes in the universe, thanks to this wonderful thing called a pandemic, have never been more grateful for fixed pricing in my office. Um, one of the significant advantages of this way of operating is from a predictability perspective as a business owner, it, it has enabled me to really clearly um, estimate and predict the cash flow and the income in my firm into the future. Um, it also means that we have absolutely no debtors. And in an environment like now, that is really powerful from a business perspective. So I lead with saying, um, if there was ever a time to think about making a shift like this, I really do think now is the time. And one of the significant advantages of this style of quoting and working from a client perspective, again, is that sense of certainty and understanding upfront of what different stages of a matter are going to cost and enabling people to genuinely invest in that decision around, can I afford this? Is this the path I want to choose? Is this genuinely something I want to do? Rather than, I guess, a time-based billing model, which more traditionally from a lawyer perspective, results in some level of fee shock or bill shock. You might give your client an estimate at the outset, but very rarely do people remember the top number. And so when the bill is issued at either the end of a stage or the end of a month or the end of a matter, um, all of a sudden, there is that moment where a client says, I didn't realise that this was going to cost the amount that it does. And all of those difficult conversations that then flow. So let's get stuck into this. Um, hopefully everything works. All right. So most of you um, would know a little bit about me, but for those that don't, I am a lawyer. I am an accredited specialist in family law. I run a firm in Brisbane called Brisbane Family Law Centre that does what it says on the tin. Uh, we just do family law. Uh, I love family law most of the time and the majority of our practice is out of court dispute resolution. So mainly mediation, collaboration and negotiation, very little litigation. 
Over the last few years, though, I've come to run what I call a side hustle, which is a second business called Happy Lawyer, Happy Life, which is how I find myself here today talking to all of you, where I help lawyers around Australia and overseas, largely with the business aspects of running a law firm. The goal being to find that wonderful thing called balance between running a successful firm, but maintaining your mental health at the same time. Um, and my own story there is something that I've shared pretty openly. I started Brisbane Family Law Centre 10, 10 years ago, no, 12 years ago now, 2008. Um, I was a pretty spring chicken lawyer at the time, and I think probably pretty naive, to be honest, about some of the challenges that came with business ownership. It chugged along okay in the initial years, as a law firm does, and then I became a mum for the first time, and I had London in 2012. And that was sort of the beginning of the end. Well, not really, she's a delight, but it was certainly the moment in time where I started to mentally struggle with the load of running a firm, um, trying to do things the way I'd done them before having a child and realizing that all of that was just not gonna be possible anymore. Um, fast forward a little bit, I found myself in a pretty tricky place and I wasn't um, diagnosed with any sort of health condition, but certainly was just, I would describe it as deeply unhappy, was struggling with the idea of how do I do this? How do I work in an industry that is, is tough? It's adversarial, it's negative, it's competitive, it's just hard, um, and maintain wellness and happiness. And I struggled to find the answer to that question. Cutting a long story short, by chance I ended up in a business course and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made, a year long business course without lawyers. There were no lawyers in this business course. There was me and a whole lot of diverse, quite entrepreneurial businesses. And that was such a wonderful learning experience for me. It really demonstrated to me that there were so many different ways that businesses run um, outside of how law firms run. And from that, I took an awful lot of inspiration in terms of how I now run the business that I have at Brisbane Family Law Centre. I started early on in that course, a blog called The Happy Family Lawyer, which largely was a very cheap website where I started just writing my own adventures in terms of the work that I was doing with clients in the divorce space, but also my own experience as a lawyer um, and some of the challenges that I was facing in terms of how I was feeling about the work that we do. And um, also realizing that there were very little resources available that could help me to untangle that. There was plenty of research around that time indicating that there were very high rates of unhappiness, burnout, and mental ill health in law, but very little that said, so this is the path out of that. Just a lot of things that said, just leave the law, which wasn't something I really wanted to do. I'd invested a lot of time, energy, and money into this profession. Um, and largely, there are, there are parts of it that I actually really love. I wrote my first book back in 2015, I think, called Splitsville. Um, I wrote a second book in and published it in 2017, Happy Lawyer, Happy Life, which is a book, I guess, pulling together the research that I was able to find on what we can do um, to try and maintain happiness in this industry. And then, of course, many of you know, I now run a podcast and, as I said earlier, a business um, working with lawyers. So in my day life as Clarissa, I am still a divorce lawyer. I would say 90% of the time, a lot of people ask me, you know, how much time do you spend being a lawyer? A lot. I, I, that's my core job. Um, but I run a couple of other things on the side. And I think it's, it's the combination that brings me a lot of joy now and enables me to stay in this profession. Um, and in a big part, I'm grateful to all of you because it's the ability to hang out with lawyers and learn together and collaborate together that's given me the ability to stay as a family lawyer, particularly. So that's how I find myself here today. I give you that context because I think it will shape and form um, particularly our conversation today about business. This is very much a business focused conversation and it's important I think to understand that much of my business ethos comes from a place of building a business, obviously that is financially sustainable. That's a, a very, very important thing, um, but very like I guess equal priority to that for me is building a business that I'm proud of and that doesn't create havoc in my life. Um, where wellness and happiness are at the core of what matters. And ironically, fixed pricing is one of the most important parts of that ethos. It's really interesting. So let's get stuck into this. Um, 
please do throw me some questions. Can you just type in the chat box, make sure you can still hear me? Because the problem with webinars is I have no idea because I can't see any of you. So can I just have a quick, yes, we can still hear you. We're not sick of your life story yet, Clarissa. Um, comment, that would be great so that I'm not worried. Great, thank you, Fiona. All right, <laughs> let's get into this. Data is your friend. So this fixed pricing thing, when I started it in my firm about five or so years ago, um, I had been in that business course that I mentioned, and I'm good friends with a lawyer here in Brisbane, Matthew Burgess, that some of you will know. He runs a great, very entrepreneurial firm, View Legal, and I'd been hanging out with Matthew, and he was, he was no timesheets, all fixed pricing, and I'd sort of swallowed the Matthew juice, and I was like, right, I'm gonna do this. I can see why this is valuable. The problem was I had no idea how. And so at our firm, um, this is, I guess, mistake number one that I encourage you not to do. I started by just tinkering with a few parts of the work that we were doing. So in family law, many of you probably do this already. We, we were already doing divorce work on largely a fixed price, simple consent orders on largely a fixed price. And so I just started, you know, tinkering with little pieces um, and trialing and erroring different prices but we were just plucking prices, to be honest, to a degree from thin air, um, which really meant that we were going, well, that probably takes about four hours and at about 400 and something dollars an hour, it's probably this much, so we'll make it that much. And there was really no analysis of why that price? Why $400 an hour? Why does anyone charge any of this? We really didn't have a lot of data. So after making a few mistakes, I then organised for one of my lawyers that had worked with me for quite a few years at that time to waste a week of his life going back through our file data, so going into our practice management system and looking at all of the different types of matters that we had worked on, putting them into categories. So saying court matter to first return date, property settlement to first return date, children's matter to first return date, collaborative matter, three meetings, mediation, complex mediation, simple, like really trying to break it down into the type of work that we've been doing. And then from that, in a spreadsheet, saying how many months that file was an active file in our office. So was this a piece of work that lasted two months? Was this a piece of work that lasted 12 months? Like what, what was it? And then from that, how much did we charge? So in the old way, using time-based yeah, time billing, how much was it for that court matter that went for two and a half years that involved all of these things? What was the penultimate price? And the more of this we did, the more interesting this became because it enabled us to stand back and go, wow, look, whenever we're doing consent orders that involve a house, some superannuation, um, maybe a small business, and if it involves a self-managed superannuation fund, look at this, there's the difference. We were able to start going, well, look, on average, a matter like that, the old way, used to always cost, or cost a client a certain amount of money. And so from that point, we suddenly became much more confident in our quoting. Fast forward a few years, the other data that I must say I've since found to be far more helpful and important is a few other pieces. One of those is what I call my magic number. Some of you have done this activity with me before, but this is working out to the dollar how much it costs to open the doors of your law firm on any given day. And so I did this at the beginning of the COVID crisis. It was one of the first activities that I did. Um, it was a number I knew prior to that, but what I wanted to do during the COVID period was work out what is the bare minimum number in this, in this sense that businesses are having to close, the economy has shifted entirely. If I take out all the fluffy stuff at Brisbane Family Law Centre that we don't really need, that's nice to have, but it's not an essential. And can I say those fluffy things are not team members? So it was just getting rid of stuff that really wasn't essential. What's the base number? to run this business, how much does it cost? And once we got that down to a day rate, a week rate, a month rate, a year rate, it also gave us a lot more confidence when it came to looking at scoping. I also have taken that number and got it right down to per team member, um, per uh, team in terms of groups of people that might work together. Like once you look at the data in your firm, you can really start to get some confidence around numbers 
And one of the hardest shifts that I see when it comes to fixed pricing is working out how to price, working out how to scope, is working out how to charge. And so rather than falling back into the old headspace of, well, this used to take four hours, so I'll multiply some hourly rate by four and away I go, all of a sudden I had all of these other numbers to play with. Because one of the really important shifts that hopefully will happen for you if you decide to take this plunge and move into the world of fixed pricing is you'll start to look for efficient ways of doing things. Because it doesn't matter how long it takes anymore, you'll start to ask the question, do I even need to do this thing? This letter that we've always done, does anyone know why we do it that way? Is there a more efficient, quicker, easier way for us to convey that piece of information? And in our team, what we've started to do over the years is answer that question with a yes and say, well, what if we recorded a video? What if we presented a webinar? What if we created a brochure? For those parts of things that are the same every single time. And all of a sudden it cuts the time down that's occurring in our firm on different matters, but it doesn't necessarily need to reduce the price. Sometimes it might appropriately, but sometimes it doesn't. So my message this morning in number one is when you decide to make this leap into the fixed pricing world, there's a couple of pieces of data that I think it's really important to have ready in your back pocket. The first one is how much it costs to run your firm each week, each day, each month. You need to be able to just say that figure off the top of your head because it's going to become really important when it comes to pricing. The other data that I think is really helpful is to go back through your matters as far back as you can and get some averages of how much people would usually pay for different things under the old method. Because that's gonna give you some comfort so you're not just plucking numbers from thin air and hoping. And what I suspect you'll start to see as you do that activity, it's not usually the type of work that changes the price, there's a whole lot of other factors. And so when it comes to pricing, we're gonna use those factors to give us confidence in how we price different clients. Please throw me any questions around data as we go. But now I'm going to talk to pricing. So tip number two, when it comes to fixed and value pricing, there is no one size fits all model. So I guess this was a bit of a mistake that I made as well early on. I was like, okay, I've done that activity. I've worked out the consent orders that look like this. We probably charge, I'm going to pluck a number from thin air, three and a half thousand dollars. And so from here on end, consent orders that look like that, we're going to charge three and a half thousand dollars. And the mistake in that is that it's not the consent orders that are complex. It'll be the client. It'll be the solicitor on the other side. <laughs> um, it'll be something entirely unknown that occurs halfway through that you could never have predicted. And so when it comes to fixed and value pricing, we don't have a menu of services and a fixed price for everything. What we have is, I guess, some um, measures around what are we looking for when we're meeting with a new client? What, what is the type of work? What is the level of complexity of that work? But what is the personality of the person we're dealing with? And what is the personality of the other person that we're dealing with? Some of which we won't know in that first meeting. So it can be really hard. And we definitely offer different pricing for different people for different things. The advantage too of this type of work with people is that you get to talk to them about what matters to them. Is this an urgent piece of work? Is this something where time is of the essence? And as a result, it means that your whole office is now in chaos because Mrs. Smith left her time limitation to two days before. And so chaos ensues. Everyone has to drop everything else to get Mrs. Smith's material ready and filed and whatever it is. For me, that comes at a higher price than I had I seen Mrs. Smith four or five or six weeks ago when I could calmly do that activity and my whole office is not in chaos. Is Mr. Smith, different matter now, so I'll call him something else actually, Mr. Jones, when you meet with Mr. Jones, is he like one of those super organised people that comes to that first appointment and he's got the folders of documents already indexed, he's done a whole of a lot of research and he's all ready to go? Or is he someone that comes in and when you ask him, you know, where's your information? Have you got anything floating around? He looks at you oddly and says, what information? I don't have anything. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Because again, the workload for your office and your team, depending on the type of person you're working with, is going to change significantly. So what we need to try and do is get into a system of really understanding who is the person I'm working for here, what is important to them, what is their budget, because that's really important. There's little point offering someone a Rolls Royce solution if at the end of the day they have a Barina budget and they don't have a capacity to shift that Barina budget. So you've got to have a very honest conversation with them around, okay, this is what I can do for a Barina budget. Um, and you might issue a scope that offers different levels of service. So ultimately they get to choose. They might say, I've got a Barina budget, but it turns out when they're offered the other options, they find a way to meet the cost of something different. The solicitor is really important as well. So you see this anyway in hourly rates, more experienced solicitors, um, you know, um, more senior people in teams, accredited specialists, often charge a higher hourly rate than a junior lawyer. And in part, that's a recognition of their experience, but it's also in part recognition of the fact that they might very efficiently do something because of all of their knowledge. And so it's similar for me, when we're pricing pieces of work in our team, it's looking at who is doing the work and pricing accordingly. So this piece is really important in the conversation as well. And I encourage you not to have a situation where it's a restaurant menu. This is all the stuff we do and here are all the prices. I encourage you to have a bespoke pricing model if you're going to move into this market. Now the significant disadvantage with that model um, is it's, it takes a lot of time. You will spend a lot of time preparing scopes um, and discussing price and resolving cost. But the good news in that is you do that at the front end before you've done any work. And what would be happening for those of you running time-based models at the moment is that I'm confident that on matters, you will find yourself midway or at the end doing that work there, having those difficult conversations around price at a time when you've already delivered the service and so in essence, the client, um, I guess, has the upper hand in some ways in that conversation. They've already got from you what they need and now they're disputing the bill. The advantage of having that conversation up front is you haven't invested all of that energy and time in doing things, but the client also is empowered to be a part of the conversation around what options do I have in this circumstance and how much will I pay accordingly? So those scoping and pricing pieces can take a number of days as people have the chance to think and consider and decide. And we often find that we might send one scope um, and I have a, a team member whose sole job is managing all of our pricing, all of our scoping, all of our billing, fixed fees and the like. And so Hannah's role when she sends a scope is then to be on the phone to the client, um, having a conversation with them, making sure they understand it. And if there are any difficulties, discussing with them what they would prefer, which parts of that proposal they're content with, which parts they don't want, what pricing they were hoping for. And then we go back to the drawing board. How do we do that in a way that meets their needs and at the same time enables us to obviously assist them. Now, Karen, you've asked me a great question. If you have someone who gives you all the requested information versus someone who doesn't know how to start, and you have to spoon feed them what you do. What do you do? I would just price that differently. I think that's the question you're asking me. I think it came from the, um, the data and the pricing conversation, but please tell me if I'm getting that wrong, Karen. Um, I, if it's a person that literally needs to be, you know, really assisted along the way, so there's two parts to that, I would assist them along the way. Um, and I would think about how we could do that. And I would have a conversation with that client around explaining, look, if you can do these pieces, this is how much it'll cost versus if I'm doing all of those pieces, this is how much it will cost. The other part though, and specifically an example in family law, there's some amazing technology products that are hitting the market that make some of these processes, for example, disclosure, much more efficient, both from a client perspective and from a solicitor perspective. One of the examples of that is a product that we're using called One Click Disclosure by Adieu. It's a, a Brisbane-based company that have been playing with technology in the family law space for probably the last eight years. And this particular part of their product, I can't speak highly enough about, certainly not a paid endorsement. I just think it's really savvy, smart, um, and we use it really heavily. One Click Disclosure enables the client to um, authorise that company to go out into the internet ether 
and pull all of their disclosure in in one day for $300. An activity that often takes months happens for $300 in one day. So now that we've got these sort of efficiencies, Karen, it's made some of these pricing issues less of a challenge because with a client who's completely disorganized, I now have a place I can go to gather that data and get started. So I'm talking obviously family law, that's the space I work in, but I'm sure that these things exist in spaces other than family law. Technology is often a beautiful solution to some of the inefficiencies that exist in how we practice. I hope that helps Karen. Tip number three, it is all about the scope. Again, I think one of the mistakes that we made early in the fixed pricing journey at my firm was that we, we started to say, let, let me give you an example. There was a matter we did early on that actually was a Hague Convention application, so complex litigation in the family law system. Um, and we gave our client a price that was whew, the price, every piece, all in together, um, which was fine until we settled that case before it went to a hearing. And then I was left in this pickle of, well, we've charged, I can't remember what it was, but let's say it was $30,000 for the beginning to end price. And we've settled it here, but there was nothing in the way that I'd structured my scope that enabled us to determine how much of that $30,000 relates to the piece of work we've done. And we ended up in this you know, difficult negotiation with our client who was quite rightly saying, well, hang on a second, it's settled, it's finished. Um, I shouldn't have to pay you all of that money. And I didn't feel comfortable with her paying us all of that money, albeit arguably on one hand, I guess you could have charged that, but it just didn't seem right to me. But then I didn't have a way of going, well, which piece relates to what? It was a great learning for me. Um, and it's a mistake I don't want any of you to make. So the message in this is it's all in the scope. And little scopes are super powerful with this type of work. Because we all know in law, that you can be heading down the path of thinking that this is a nice, simple negotiation with two reasonably amicable people and we're going to have a settlement next week. And before you know it, it's turned into a snowball of disaster. And if you've done a fixed price quote that was for a nice, amicable settlement and everything's included and it's $5,000 and before you know it, the snowball of disaster has taken over and you don't have a get out of jail free card, you're going to find yourself doing an awful lot of work for free. So in this little situation, the way I try and think about it is a flow chart. You know, we go to here and then if this happens, we go to here. And then if this happens, we go to here. And then if this happens, we go to here. And in my world of family law, everything ends at settlement documents. That for me is whichever path you take, you will ultimately find yourself with some form of settlement document, whether it be a consent order, whether it be a parenting plan, whether it be a child support agreement, whether it be a court order with a 50,000 page of judgment, whatever it is, what you're ultimately buying from us is an experience and a document. And so by using this flowchart system, that's how we develop our scopes. So if this was a brand new client coming in to see me that I knew largely nothing about, our scopes will be broken down into different steps and stages. Let's take a financial matter as an example. The first stage, assuming they're not doing collaborative practice because it's a conversation that's slightly different, but let's assume it's a reasonably standard matter where you can predict there'll be some gathering of information, some level of discussion and negotiation. Um, you may need a resolution event such as a mediation and then ultimately there'll be a document. Then I have a flowchart that says all of those things. So we gather this information, we help you um, consider some proposals, we ultimately, if you need mediation because those proposals didn't resolve the matter then this is what that looks like and then at the end we have documents and we price out as many of those steps and stages as we predictably can at the beginning but sometimes we can't price them all but we at least give the client a sense of here are all the potential steps in a visual document and some estimates for the pieces where they may not need them but at least have an understanding of what they look like one of the mistakes I made early on is we were doing teeny tiny scopes because we were so anxious about, oh, we don't know anything. So we'll just do a scope for the next two weeks and then we'll worry about the rest later. And on one hand, I guess that was helpful because it enabled people to work with us for two weeks, but we'd get to the end of the two weeks and then they'd be saying, well, what's next? And suddenly they'd get a quote for something that was like this. And I was saying, but I didn't, I, I can't afford that. It's not what I wanted. It's not what was going on. And so by being really upfront and saying visually, here are the likely pathways that you'll find yourself on. 
And here are the likely costs with some of those pathways. People, again, from the outset can be far more empowered to make decisions around the, the process that they're choosing. The other beautiful thing about working like this, when you run a team like I do, and I run a team of many um, juniors and law students, is that that scope becomes like a project plan. And so by breaking it down in a very detailed way in how you explain to the client, these are the things we're doing, it then sets out, in essence, for your team, these are the things that we're doing. And it becomes a bit like a checklist that you can start working through as you delegate work to different people in your team. Someone does this, someone does that. The other thing you can start to do when you work in this way is look at efficiencies again through, say, technology on how you might do parts of those pieces of work. A really simple example is creating some online forms that your client might be able to complete that enables them to do some of that data gather so that your team's not doing it. So you can really, again, start to look at the efficiencies when you start breaking this down into steps. Any questions about scoping? I'm gonna show you some examples of how scopes look in our firm a little bit further down, if that helps at all. Um, but any questions about that before I keep going today? There's always the lag between me asking that and questions appearing in the chat box. Pausing for questions, keep going, all right. Lesson number four in the BFLC flip to from time to fixed pricing is to toss the timesheets. So the next mistake that we made was that we were trying to do fixed pricing, but we were still time recording. And I got into this wonderful little tricky situation early on where I'd had one of the lawyers in my team do a quote for a quite a small piece of work. So it was a thousand-ish dollar quote for something. She did that piece of work and she was still time recording and the time recorded entries equated to 500 or something dollars. And so rather than issuing the agreed bill for the money in trust that she had of 1,000 or so dollars, she issued a bill for 500 or something dollars. And I went to her and said, oh, just, just let me understand why we've still got this money in trust and why this bill of $500 was sent. And she came back to me um, and said, oh, well, I just, it didn't take as long as I thought it would. And so I just, you know, didn't charge her as much as I had said I would. And on one hand, you might say, well, that's lovely for the client. <laughs> and that's true. And I said to this team member a little bit quirkily, just out of interest, are you content for me to just halve your salary this week on the basis that it didn't take you as much time and so therefore I can just pay you a different amount? She looked at me oddly and said, no. And I said, you know, this is the point. The point with fixed pricing is it's not about the time, it's about the outcome. And so by keeping timesheets, the mistake as such that we made or the difficulty that arose is it forced us to keep doing this mental analysis. The old way, this would have resulted in this amount. The new way, it's resulted in this amount. And the irony with timesheets and time-based billing is it's not a measure of anything actually useful and when it comes to the success of your business, um, the productivity of your business, any of these sorts of things, actually a really unhelpful metric. It doesn't mean that your business is profitable. It just means that a lawyer or a person using a timesheet sat there for so many hours filling in gaps around what they did today. But it doesn't mean that what they did was successful for the client. It doesn't mean that they got a great outcome. It's merely a metric recording what they were doing. When you move to fixed pricing, the outcome becomes the focus the agreed goal. What are we trying to achieve for this person? What is their strategy? What is their outcome? What, what is it? What is the thing that they need? And when you make that mental flip, how much time it takes to get there disappears. The other thing to think about, and some of you on this call are very experienced lawyers, how many hours have you invested in your mind, in your education, in your knowledge? And the more experienced you become, usually, the more efficient you become, at being able to solve a problem. So a problem might be deeply complex, but because of your years of experience and having seen this problem over and over again, you're actually able to solve it in 10 minutes. But that solution that you delivered in 10 minutes might actually be worth, certainly when you step out of the family law space into some of the commercial spaces, it can be worth a significant sum to people. And so again, when you move into fixed and value pricing, the conversation becomes one of, what does this mean for the person that I'm assisting? 
what is the value to them in this activity? And therefore, what is the agreed price in how we're gonna help them solve it? So my message in all of that is, if you're going to make this adventurous jump, you are going to have to give some consideration to how and why and if you continue to use traditional timesheets because you will start to create this tricky situation where your mind is going old way, new way. Oh, what does that mean? Um, and for us, the success with fixed pricing came when I just went into my office one morning and said, guys, from today, no more time recording. It's not something I ever enjoyed as a solicitor. It's not something I enjoyed as a business owner. We, I was never great at setting people targets and making them achieve them anyway when it came to daily time recording. Um, and so we simply got rid of them and we don't have them now. Uh, in terms of financial goals, the way my firm works is we have that magic number that I mentioned to you at, um, earlier in this conversation. My team know the magic number and every week as a team, we're trying to achieve the magic number. And I don't care where the income comes from in terms of who was doing the task or which lawyer was doing it. We have a small enough team that I could tell you very quickly if someone wasn't um, performing in a way they needed to be. It would be very transparent in our team. And so um, we tossed all of the timesheets, focus on the outcome and away we go. Now, Naomi's asked me a great question. What if someone itemized, wants an itemized bill? So your scope at the beginning technically is your itemized bill. Your file can still be cost assessed in exactly the same way. But as I understand it, I haven't had it happen for me, but as I understand it, the cost assessor will go to your cost agreement and look at the fixed pricing. And I guess if you were just charging something entirely ridiculous, there may be some challenges. But in my experience, most fixed pricing firms don't charge ridiculous. They charge very sensible. But Naomi, it, it would be no different. You would still have all of the tasks that you've done will still be apparent on your file. You just may not have a timesheet that's easily able to be printed. But what you should have is a scope that you agreed at the beginning that will have the majority of those tasks in it. Um, David's asked me a question around, do I include a limit on telephone calls and conferences? Yes, I can. Um, and some we don't. So again, it depends. We use retainers a lot. Retainers being people pay a fortnightly or monthly fee. And within that, they get a level of service and there's different levels of retainers in our firms. I'll show you an example of that in a minute, David, that might help um, with that as well. And I saw there were two hands that went up. Um, but I can't find those questions. So if, if you were one of those people, just pop those questions in the chat box. My Q&A seems to, yeah, I think I've answered everything, but please just pop them in. I'm trying to keep an eye on them as I keep going. Um, the other example I just want to give you, and it crosses into timesheets and scoping. When um, in 2018, my husband and I did quite a significant renovation on our house. Anyone that's lived through a renovation, you know how joyous that is, but we actually have had a great builder. Um, and I have good stories to tell about Kirk, but one of the things I really appreciated about Kirk, our builder, was he did a fixed price quote for our build. And that was important because like all building projects, it was meant to finish in 12 weeks and it ended up taking six months. <laughs> so I was really grateful for my fixed price quote. But it took Kirk three weeks to develop the quote that he ultimately gave us. And it went for pages. It was like a 20 page document that had a schedule attached to it with every single tiny weeny thing that was going to be needed and done to ultimately do this renovation on our home. And so it was really clear for us from the outset, that A, this is the price and B, here are all of the things that are included in that price. And then as we started the build um, and he started to do things, one of the first examples of this was, as is often the case with uh, building work, they started to do the footings and look to what was going on under the house. And of course, their soil wasn't as it was expected to be, which resulted in us needing to have more footings from memory. I'm no builder. Um, but anyway, there were things that needed to occur that weren't in the quote. And so um, simply, Kirk has a conversation with us and says, this is what we've quoted for. This is what's now required. Here is the difference. Here's a variation of my contract to account for that difference. And so, of course, I guess we had a choice to say, well, we don't want the extra footings. But the challenge with that is, of course, that the uh, footings and the house might fall down. So it was a necessary thing. And this went on as the build went on. Some of you know me well. So as the build went on, I was like, oh, I need some skylights. 
look at this house, this needs skylights. And Kirk would say, no problem. And he'd go and get a quote and he'd give me a variation and he'd say, you can have those skylights, Clarissa, but here's the price tag that comes with them. And I'd say, oh, okay, I'll have the skylights. Um, and there were also variations down. As we were building, Ollie and I'd stand in our house and go, oh, we don't need that, that thing, whatever that thing was. We don't need it. Take that out. And so he'd vary down. And so this project, as it went on for six months, there were just, there's the base contract and then the price went up or down as things were added or deleted. And this is exactly the same approach that I use in my legal work. As much as possible, here's the base contract of all of the potential things that I can see coming and then add and delete as we need to. That process works incredibly well in litigation. I think litigation is actually one of the easier pieces to fix price, ironically because there are steps and stages that you sort of know are gonna happen, but you don't know necessarily if someone's going to file an application in a case or if they're gonna file 50 subpoenas or um, if the court's gonna adjourn because the judge is unwell. You know, these are the things that would be the variation up, variation down. What's really important is the client communication in this. And that's no different whether you're doing fixed pricing or time-based billing. There are so many uncertainties in the work that we do and being really upfront with clients around here are some of the unusual things that I've seen in my career that may happen to you. Um, you probably can't list them all, but weird stuff happens and having very honest conversations with your clients as you go. Now, Anna's asking me some questions around cost agreements. Okay. Bank required, ah, oh, this is personal injury work, Anna. It's so not my space. Um, I do still have a traditional looking cost agreement. So at the beginning of a matter, we um, issue a cost agreement and then separately a scope. And then we just keep re-scoping as the matter goes on. But our cost agreement would still look very much like yours would look. Um, I'm trying to think who in the personal injury space is doing, I mean, there's definitely people doing it that we could have a bit more of a conversation with. I'm certainly no expert on the requirements in the PI space, but firms are doing it. And there's always a way. We're just going to keep sort of looking at what are the requirements and rules and how do we ensure that we meet them. Um, with our cost agreement, oh yeah, Leah James. Thank you, Claire. She does, of course. Um, Leah was on my podcast a little while ago. So she's a personal injury practitioner here in Brisbane that runs her own firm and she does do fixed pricing. You're quite right. So she'd be worth having a chat to Anna to see what she's doing in terms of how she's ensuring that when we need to obviously all comply with the rules and regulations, but still offering this style of service for people. Um, now, your question to me was, I've been in a situation where I was not time recording and the cost agreement was on a scale but the bank required work in progress reports so then needed to time record even though we weren't actually bill on that basis okay i think that one i would solve this way rightly or wrongly through my scoping thing in the sense of having stage one stage two stage three stage four and i would issue the bill at stage one even though it's not going to get paid in the sense of that, that i guess is your work in progress bill and then at stage two i issue a bill and that's what that looks like i'll show you how we do that and I think there'll be a way for us to um, apply that in personal injury work. Um, just my final tip before I show you some examples is fixed and, fixed and value pricing will cause a whole of business shift. So this isn't something where tomorrow you can just say to yourself, all right, team, we're just going to flip everything and everything from tomorrow is fixed pricing. You really do need to spend some time thinking about how your business runs, how you want your business to run. Now, actually, part of this is so joyous because for me, what's happened is it is a whole of business shift. It's created beautiful efficiencies. It's enabled us to focus on outcome. It's enabled us to look at um, how we can use technology to better improve processes for clients. I've Murray condoed everything in my practice so that I can sit back and go, why do we do that? Does anyone know why that standard letter goes out all the time? Is that even helpful? Does anyone know why advices go in a 20 page, long, boring word document in Times New Roman? Do our clients even understand them? Is there a better way of conveying that information so that the client actually understands what's going on, but we're still obviously meeting our requirements and ensuring risk is managed. And somewhere here, there's a beautiful balance. Karen, I deal with Lexon in exactly the way I deal with Lexon. There is nothing different here. You are still meeting all of the requirements that you have as a lawyer. And if anything, I haven't had any Lexon issues in my career, yay. Um, and the client complaints in this model are about zero because you'll get the issue at the front end, not down here. 
if you're doing this appropriately. And what I mean by that is communicating really clearly, this is what's happening, this is the price. And the minute that variation moment comes in, picking up the phone and saying, this is what's happened and this is the price. And so you've got to set up that type of communication in a really clear way from the outset. I suspect you will have this anyway. Because again, with family law, with personal injuries, with any aspect of law, none of us, when we sit and meet with a client on the first day, can say absolutely 100%, I can predict every possible thing that's about to happen to you over the next 12 months. We can predict some you know, big picture things, we can't predict the micro. And so just being honest about that um, is a really powerful, important thing. One of the big business shifts though that will occur, particularly if you toss timesheets, is so many firms, KPIs, are built around timesheets. You know, productivity for solicitors, meeting budgets in terms of time, all of these things are how you measure success. And so once you take those out, you're gonna to have to rethink how do we measure success in our business? Um, what does that look like? How are we gonna track finances? Are we gonna have a team budget? Are we still having individual budgets? What are the measures? What are we gonna do here? Um, for me, that whole business shift has been wonderful, but it certainly wasn't easy in the beginning. All right, I just wanna try and show you a few examples. So just gonna come out of that screen share and hopefully bring up something that I thought I had ready to go earlier that now doesn't appear to be there. Hang on, <laughs> let, me, let me just quickly do that. While I'm doing that, if you do have any other questions, oops, out of that screen, that's not what I want. Um, all right, now we should be good. Back here. Ah, that's on. So helpful when you try and do something like this. And ah, there we are. Okay, this is an example of how a scope looks in our firm for a retainer type matter. So, um, oh, come on little slide, here we are. So this is how it looks when we send it to clients. So you can see this is a fortnightly retainer. Um, it's around about 500 and something dollars a week. So $1,118 is a very random number for you. A fortnight, um, we've asked this client to cover two instalments so that we can commence work. Well, it must be 500 something a fortnight. Sorry, my maths is terrible. That's great, isn't it? Anyway, it's a retainer <laughs> um, type scope. This is how our scopes look. So we send it out saying, here are the lawyers in our firm, um, obviously showing who we all are. Here's everyone else in our firm so that you know who that you're dealing with. And then it goes through and says, these are the next steps. going to fly through this one. Um, in terms of the retainer, you can see, and this was David's question, this one says all email communications between you and our office relating to your matter to assist you in negotiating and communicating, gathering your financial over information and case planning, up to two telephone calls a fortnight to discuss issues, one meeting per month if required. And we would just change that depending on the person and depending what they're after. Some people might want more than two telephone calls, some people might want more than one meeting, some people might want less than that. But by putting these boundaries around this, we find that people do actually stick to them. I know that's always the question I get asked. Oh, but clients, they'll just ring. Once they know they're on a retainer, they'll ring. Well, I guess they could. But if you're anything like me, the capacity for them to actually speak to me multiple times over the series of days because of my life is very limited. And so what we try and do with this sort of model is book people in. If you sign up to a retainer, then let's book in your calls. Let's book in your meetings. Let's set it all up so that they can plan at their end um, and it's all secured and organised for them as well. Now again, if you're on a retainer and something happens, you get served with proceedings that was not expected, that's okay. We just pause, have a conversation, issue a scope for what that looks like, and the client has a choice around how they want to engage with that next stage. Um, we then include our billing timeframes in our scope, so when we're going to bill this person, um, what it doesn't include will be set out in the scope. Um, and then this is at the back, some information for people around different prices for different things that exist for their type of matter. So again, these prices would change depending on the complexity of a, a file, but giving them a guide, you're on a retainer at the moment, it's early, this is what it might look like if we were moving into different stages. 
some information about what a fixed fee is for clients. And then of course, the magic page where people sign. So that's one example of a pretty simple retainer document um, that we use in our firm. And then I'm just gonna try and bring up another one for you, which is a more complex scope for an arbitration. As I'm silent, please feel free to ask me questions while I try and make my silly slides work. All right, let's see if I can make this share work again. Yes, okay. So this um, same format, as you can see in terms of the visual document, this is really important to me. It's something I've been doing a lot in our firm is trying to change how we present information to people to make it less confronting, particularly when you're about to see some of the prices that exist in this document. I think it's really important to Think about when you're sending people bills or scopes for very large numbers, ensuring that it's clear and ensuring that the um, information is easy to understand. So same beginning, I won't give you that again. Um, but this was an arbitration matter that I did last year. And these were the steps in that arbitration. So there was a directions hearing, we had to prepare evidence, we had to review the other person's evidence, file any affidavits in reply written submissions, attendance at a hearing, advice to you, and ultimately the registration of the award and the court attendance. So you can see the flowchart system here through a series of boxes around this, this is the steps and this is what's going to happen. And then we just break it down. So each step has its own scope. Attendance at the direction hearing, that was pretty easy. It was like a half hour, one hour phone call type situation, but attending it, liaising, preparing for it, whatever it is. And then it just keeps going. Preparation for the evidence in the sense of what I had to do there and the price for that piece. Um, review of the other party's evidence. Filing an affidavit in reply. And you'll see the note there, if required. It ultimately wasn't required. So this is that sort of, if we go back to the building analogy, the variation down. Here's a piece that might be required, but it's actually not. And so ultimately we didn't charge, obviously, for that piece of work because we didn't have to do it. Um, written submissions in a minute of order. Attendance at the hearing. Again, there wasn't a hearing, so that wasn't required. So that piece came out. Um, ultimately, the advice to the client on the outcome and the registration. And again, that had pieces in it dependent on whether the registration required an attendance or not. Then importantly, these billing timeframe pages. This is probably one of the most important parts of the scope document and in terms of your business, um, a very, very important part of the business itself. So you can see there that we break down um, the, the steps into parts. So step one was a smaller number, you might remember of I think $900. Step two was about 4,000 and something dollars. So you can see upon me reviewing the evidence that was filed, upon me preparing the affidavits, upon me providing that advice and then serving the material. And a big reason why I break these numbers down is cash flow and business management. I pay my team on a weekly basis. The majority of my expenses run on that sort of model. I don't want a situation where, I guess for you personal injury lawyers, this is how you all live. I don't want that. I don't need to have that. So we do things in steps and stages. And we tell people very clearly, here are the steps and stages and here are the billing events. And we try and ensure that our billing events are connected to things that are within our or our client's control and are not reliant upon external people such as the other party. Because you have no control over when the other party might respond to you or might do something or send something. So we try and keep them all connected to steps that we're taking or that our client is taking. And we've found that that is a really successful way of working. When it comes to pricing something like this and ultimately requiring money in trust, the other thing that we look at doing is saying to our client, you know, do I want all step eight amounts in trust? Do I want steps one, two, and three? And then once we've completed that, the next stages, that's the conversation again, you're gonna have with your client around what's their capacity? Do they have money? What's going on? In this particular example, my client was borrowing money to meet these costs. And so he did put the entire amount in trust and it's just been billed as the matter progressed through. Um, and I think that, just has the same what is a fixed fee uh, document. So, we have that one. Hopefully come back to the other one. Um, now, Jamie, you've asked me, what do I use to build those things? Well, I have two special secrets in that. Um, I 
I love design, so I don't mind building things on products and programs. Uh, but what you've just seen in terms of those scopes is built in PowerPoint. So nothing fancy, <laughs> actually really easy. And Hannah, who's my person that manages this in my firm, she was actually the one that built those. Uh, and she said to me, she decided to use PowerPoint because it didn't require a designer, it didn't require anyone external. It was something super easy that she could do and update as she goes. We do actually have a designer in our team full time. Um, Sarah and Sarah is beautiful at the work that she does. Many of the slides that you've seen in today's presentation are as a result of the work that Sarah does. Uh, but importantly, we wanted it to be visual, but we wanted it to be easy, not something that had to be outsourced to another person, a designer, every time we need a scope, because these scopes change all the time. And a big part of Hannah's job is um, managing that. So PowerPoint, that easy. Um, that's how we do it. So any questions about those examples? I'm hoping you can see my slides again. Just coming back to my quick little question box. I think I've answered all of those ones. Push them out of the way. I've lost my chat box, so I'm just trying to find that again. Okay. Oh, thanks, Karen. There'll be typos all through my things, I'm sure. I go through and change the numbers when I'm doing these examples for presentations, so they, the maths probably doesn't add up because I've randomly changed things. Um, I have some, I guess, resources that you can use beyond today. So one of those is we do sell um, precedent packs, which include our cost agreements and examples of the different scopes that we have. They are obviously quite family law centric, but in I would say to you, and I've certainly had lawyers in different disciplines use those packs, you're welcome to grab them um, and use them as you wish. And that would give you a better example of a more broad range of documents that we use. Um, and in terms of, I guess, another resource, I, I, it's no secret, I run a lot of courses, but I am running another four week fixed pricing course starting Friday next week. Um, I've just finished running one only about four weeks ago and there's been a lot of interest in this space so I've decided to run another one. So if you would like to be a part of a four week program, the information for that is on my website happylawyerhappywife.com. Um, we'll send the email out tomorrow with a recording of this and the information for that for you as well. But that will certainly give you the chance to, I guess, deep dive um, me, help you work out all of the numbers and the data that we've been talking about and, and build scopes in live time and test things in your practice. Um, it's a really enjoyable course, actually. And we had a real mix of people in the version that we just finished from all over the world, which was really interesting, like so interesting to see how practitioners in the Netherlands are doing things and practitioners in Canada and practitioners in New Zealand and Australia. So. I'm actually really grateful for the COVID pandemic. One of my New Year's resolutions is to move my teaching into the online space and I wouldn't have done it um, as efficiently if I um, hadn't found myself in a pandemic and not being able to travel and deliver these workshops. And one of the real advantages I, I observed when we ran the fixed pricing workshop online, usually I do it in a day, in a, a day workshop, which is lovely. But in terms of implementation, I don't think that's actually very helpful. And what I observed is when we broke it down into four weeks and the people in the course got to do a piece this week and a piece that week and actually do the parts on the way, they've been able to implement it much quicker. Um, Catherine, to answer your question, you can find those fixed pricing packs on my website, happylawyerhappylife.com forward slash fixed pricing packs. If you can't find it, click me an email, but um, no doubt Sarah will include it in the email that comes to you tomorrow. So my challenge to you guys today, thank you so much for listening to me as the first one. And my challenge to you is just have a go. Pick something that is, I guess, easier, more predictable in the type of work you're doing and put a fixed price to it and see what happens and have a conversation with your clients around would they appreciate fixed pricing and have a conversation with your team around what they think could be fixed. Um, because it, it is very hard to make the whole of business shift but there are certainly parts of the work that you do that I suspect you could easily build into these sorts of models. Retainers particularly where people are paying a monthly or a fortnightly or a weekly amount, I find have been very valuable for the clients that I work with. And a lot of the clients I work with really appreciate that model, um, particularly in the early stage of a family law matter where there's uncertainty around what am I even doing? Where is this going? Can I do this myself? That style of work has been very attractive and successful in our firm. So that, my friends, is fixed pricing the basics. 
I actually kept to time, which is a really rare thing for me. <laughs> so um, it's probably because I all had you in webinar mode and you couldn't talk to me. And normally I talk far too much. If there are any final questions, please throw them at me. Uh, but otherwise, I encourage you to go and have a go. See where it takes you. Have some fun. But raised hands. I never know what this raised hand means, team. So if you've got a raised hand and you have a question, please tell me. Lara, are you wanting to talk? I, I can press a button that says allow to talk or Catherine. Yeah, my question oh. was um, <laughs> just how, how do clients respond to having to pay up front when traditionally they're used to getting a bill at the end of a matter? So in my world, Lara, um, you know, these clients as such have probably never dealt with lawyers before. So they don't have a preconceived notion of getting a bill at the end. I suspect if you were working in, uh, you know, an area where a client is used to this type of thing where they get a bill at the end and then you're flipping it, you would need to have a conversation with them around that. But um, I, I check the expectations because many people haven't dealt with lawyers before and so they don't have a preconceived idea of how that's going to work. The other side of it is certainly in my firm, even before fixed pricing, we were requiring money in trust, which was sort of similar. Mm. And that money and trust would last and work for a period of time and then it would obviously run out and that would be the end of it. So I, I don't think you'll find that much kickback. If it's someone that you've worked with under a different payment arrangement for a long time, pick up the phone and say to them, I'm thinking about changing how we work. These are the reasons why. And the reasons why need to be what's in it for them more so than what's in it for you. What's in it for a client is certainty. People love certainty. I love certainty. If I was engaging a lawyer or any professional services provider and they said to me, this is the price, I would say, thank you, wonderful. Versus if they said, look, it could be anywhere from here to here, I'd be saying, no, 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 no. I need the price. Um, and so I think that, that there's a real value in that for people in saying this is the price and giving them that commitment. And then they're able to budget for their own business. Like I know this, I'm, I regularly am using legal services for my own business and I demand fixed pricing because that's how I work. And what it does is it enables me to go, this is how much that costs. Okay. So now I can budget that for the months ahead and ensure that I can afford it. And that's a really important thing. So I think have the conversation is my answer and see what they say. Thank you. That's really helpful. No worries. Catherine, I'm pressing the button that says allow you to talk. Did you have a question for me? Nope, she has a hand up, but maybe not. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask of me? Now is your time. Oh, there's a Q&A box here. Sorry, there's too many Q&A boxes. David, you've asked me. Is each stage of the scope individually costed? When you said affidavit wasn't needed, so cost was, yeah. The cost of that item, yes. So David, in that arbitration example, you would have seen, and I did it very quickly, so apologies, you may not have seen it on the slide. Um, for example, the affidavit in reply had its own cost. So when I didn't have to do the affidavit in reply, that cost just simply wasn't charged. And so that's why I really do encourage you to break things down into small chunks, albeit give a scope for as much as you can, but have steps within the scope for the small chunks because it'll enable you to drop off things that aren't needed, but also add things that are, that were unexpected, really, really important. So going back to my building example of the renovation and the, the builder adding and deleting accordingly. Keith Mole, <laughs> lovely to see you. Good morning. <laughs> um, Jen, the master classes are at this time in the morning or at 4 p.m. in the afternoon in Australia. Um, I had a Canadian participant in the last version and he was able to get to them because I think what they relate to is your, I don't know what time it is for you over there, um, but I tried to make them so that it, they were possible for you to get to. I know I sat and looked at the overseas time zones. <laughs> it's a real trick. They are all recorded though, and you can obviously work, um, watch the recordings. Great. So if it's 6 p.m., so... I alternate between what is 8 a.m., which is your 6 p.m., and then what is our 4 p.m., which must be your very early in the morning. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I can certainly look at that timing for you if you wanted to do that. 
excuse me. Anything else, team? <laughs> time, time zone get me every time. Even in Australia, we have like four different time zones and it just constantly, I'm like, what time is it for the people in Perth and Adelaide and Darwin and Brisbane and daylight saving? It's just the death of me, time zones. All right, I can't see any other questions. So thank you everyone for getting up early on your Thursday morning and hanging out with me. Um, and I will otherwise see you somewhere in the ether. Um, have a great day. Enjoy your fixed pricing. Send me any questions and yeah, see you later. <laughs>